for inviting me for this uh, prestigious and very nice meeting. You have been listening to a lot of lectures over the past two days. So uh, my brief is to discuss approach to pituitary incident lomas with you. Now, sorry, what is the definition of a pituitary incident loma? Pituitary incident lomas are clinically inapparent pituitary masses, which be more clinical features that are discovered on CT or MR evaluation, generally on MR, on CT, unless they're very big, you can't see, of the brain for an unrelated condition in a patient without overt signs or symptoms of pituitary disease. So this is very clear. If you're doing uh, MRI or CT, thinking there could be Cushing's, thinking there could be acromegaly, thinking there could be panhypopituitarism, then that's not a pituitary incident alone. So let's walk through a lady, 36 year old, seen in the neurology clinic for non-specific giddiness, hyperlipidemia on statin, pulses okay, blood pressure is all right, systemic examination is normal, fundus is normal, and as would happen if you go to non-specific giddiness to a neurology clinic, you end up getting a CT scan, which is for the maybe up marketplace with the patient for an MRI. Now, before I show you the MRI of the patient, this is what the MRI of a normal pituitary looks like. This is taken from the Williams textbook. Uh, you can see the reference down below. Uh, this is the optic chiasm. Uh, then there's a pituitary gland, there is a stalk, there's the sphenoid sinus, that is the intracranial carotid artery. And what to know, a lot of nerves which pass through the cavernous sinus. And that is a schematic representation, and that is an actual MR, again showing the optic chiasm, stalk, pituitary. The stalk should generally be less than four millimeters in size. You can see the intracarotid artery, that's the sphenoid sinus, which is aerated. So if you see this young lady's MRI, this is pre-contrast, this is sagittal, this is coronal, these are T1 weighted images, where the CSF is black in color. And you can already see that that's the stalk, that's the optic chiasm tip there, and you can see that the convex margin to the pituitary. But you don't really see an adenoma here or, or, or an incidentaloma here. But when you come to the coronal films, there's a clear cut, unequivocal, hypodense lesion here measuring about 8 millimeters in size. And then when contrast is given, something seems to be there, but then that is much better identified on the T1 post gadolinium enhanced uh, MR images, where you can see the incidentaloma. The reason this is incidental loma is because this lady had no overt symptoms of endocrine disease. She had only come from non specific giddiness, which probably could have been due to any of many things. And uh, incidentally, this tumor was discovered, adenoma was discovered, and now you're in trouble. What to do with this? That's the whole purpose of this lecture of the next 15 to 20 minutes. How often to expect them? This is very variable. This is a meta analysis. It can be as little as 1.5%. This is all, all autopsy series, if you can see on the top. This autopsy series, as much as 27%. Now, this is an overkill, I think. Only 100 autopsies were studied, where they found 27 adenomas. Maybe the ballpark figure, if you see down below, is about 1 in 10. Now, 1 in 10 also, to me, sounds a little in excess, because we do so many MRIs. We don't see incidental lomas. So these are autopsy studies, you see, where they go and chop the pituitary into small, small details and they end up finding 2 millimeter, 3 millimeter pituitary adenomas. But if you see, most of them are microadenomas and then there have been CT and MR studies, where also if you see macroadenomas more than 1 centimeter or 10 millimeter in size, are far less as compared to microadenomas. So incidentally, you discover microadenomas, rarely you may end up discovering a macroadenoma. So this lady with the small microadenoma there, that is the history. What do you do next? So the first thing is please do not think, refer to a neurosurgeon, inverted commas, brain tumor. No, pituitary tumor, refer to the neurosurgeon, please don't. Refer to an endocrinologist first because most incidental lomas do not require immediate or sometimes late surgical intervention. My last slide will give you the indications for surgical intervention in, a, in an incidentally detected pituitary lesion. The second thing we should do is what we've already done, we've critically reviewed the MRI of this young lady. Why? Because there can be so many things which can be discovered. Uh, an incident ploma does not always mean an adenoma. Is it pituitary hypertrophy, hyperplasia? Is it a non adenomatous cellular mass? Is it a paracellular mass? Or is it an adenomatous cellular mass? If you see, 9 out of 10 times, there are adenomas, like you saw in this young lady. 
But sometimes you may end up discovering comes with non-specific dizziness. You may end up finding a meningioma. You can end up finding a germinoma. You can end up finding a rat dyslepsis. So you need to first see the MRI yourself or discuss with your neuroradiologist and confirm that it is what is it. So if you think about hyperplasia, this was a young lady I I, I followed up long time ago, <laughs> almost twenty years ago. Pretty looks great. Convex margin looks there's a convex margin. It is not. Uh, compressing the optic chiasm, optic chiasm is quite clear from, from, from this Q3, but the height is 12 millimeters. She had presented again with headache and giddiness to the neurologist, was found to have anemia. But then this MRI showed this lesion. So, height of normal pituitary ranges from 3 to 9 millimeters in healthy women between the age of 15 to 30. Data from three large neurological neurological series, 600. If you see 0.5%, that's almost 30 out of 600, will have a pituitary size which is more than 9 millimeter. Getting a size of 11, 12 millimeters, not so common, but you should keep that in mind. And these images are generally seen in adolescent girls between the age of 10 to 19. We had the opportunity, this is uh, a patient can do repeat MRIs because of uh, availability and uh, this patient, I'm not showing the serial MRIs, this lady was followed up over over about eight, 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 uh, about seven and a half, eight years and you see there's been no change in the size, you don't see any uh, adenoma, you don't see any macroadenoma, so this was a hyperplasia. She was subsequently followed by, by my colleagues when I left uh, the, that unit. And over 20 years follow up, subsequently, I don't have those MRIs because I left that unit, the, the lesion had shrunk. Is this a non adenomatous, not an adenoma, cellar mass? There are so many things which can be there. It can be a germ cell tumor, a craniopharyngioma, meningioma, cordoma, pituitary carcinoma, metastases. These are very rare metastases. I, in my career, have seen three or four. Pituitary carcinoma, very rare. Uh, cordoma, very rare. Meningioma is quite common, actually. Cranio, again, generally they present in, in children, but you can have adult onset cranio pharyngioma. Sometimes you detect them as an incident loma. Majority of the times you go looking for a cranio because there are symptoms. So generally they are not an incident loma. Germ cell tumors are also generally not an incident loma. Take this young lady, was followed up for four years in the gyne unit because she had presented with aminoria, galactoria, prolactin was five times elevated. Uh, they had this MRI and they thought this is a pituitary adenoma, prolactinoma was treated for about four years uh, on, on uh, initially bromocriptine, later cabagulin. Of course, the periods returned, of course, the galactoria disappeared. But unfortunately, this lesion kept increasing and it's, it's an obvious no-brainer. This is not a pituitary lesion. This is, you can see the stock. I told you the stock should not be more than four millimeters. Look at the huge thick stock going up into the hypothalamic region. So this was a dysgerminoma. You need to do beta HCG either in the blood or in CSF. And the treatment is very simple. You have to give radiotherapy. And you see what happens after radiotherapy, the lesion shrinks, the stalk becomes okay. But the downside is the patient becomes pan hypopituitary. <coughs> what about a craniopharyngioma? As I told you, generally, generally you don't uh, get them as an incidental loma, but you, you may be surprised. They, they are generally cellar, supracellar lesions. Uh, if they are supracellar, then they are more of a cranio than a rat sclepsis. And they, they have a cystic lesion with some fatty components so that becomes a cranio pharyngioma. You can have a meningioma. A meningioma is not that uncommon. And uh, if you're not uh, initiated, you may, mis uh, you may misinterpret a meningioma for an adenoma. Look at this nice big thing. You may end up thinking this is a large pituitary macroadenoma. But then it is a meningioma. Why? Because there's something called the dural tail sign. The, men the meningioma makes the dural tail hyper enhanced. And I am wiser because this is operated and we got the histopathologist meningioma. But to be fair, our neurosurgeon, one look at the MRI had said this is a meningioma. I, when I first saw this MRI, I was under the impression I'm dealing with a particular macroadenoma. Then he taught me this. I'm teaching you this. Well, this is a long time ago. So I, I, le I learned this dural tail sign which uh, which uh, point towards a meningioma. It can be sarcoidosis, lymphocytic granulomatous hypos, hypophysitis, histocytosis, but these are generally not pituitary lesions. These are generally pituitary stock and hypothalamic lesions. You can incidentally find a rat sclepsis. Uh, this is one of the seminal papers which we wrote way back, I think in 1997. And if you Google this, this is quoted everywhere. Why? It's a very simple paper. We just had 12 patients 
uh, with Ratcliffe's Leptis because prior to this paper in 1997, everybody thought Ratcliffe's Leptis do not recur. They're just benign things, just leave them or marsupialize them and they don't recur, they don't cause panhypopic, just leave them alone. But we had 12 patients, we found that they presented symptoms, they get panhypo, some of them get panhypopic and we found that uh, uh, they can recur. So this, uh, this paper is quoted every time a rapid sclerosis is described. Uh, and if you see, this is how a rapid sclerosis looks like. It's quite different from a craniopharyngioma. Very nice thin wall filled with uh, with fluid. And why is fluid? Because on T2-weighted MR coronal section and T2, the CSF is, is, is white. You can see this is full of fluids. So now, is it pituitary hypertrophy in our patient? No, because it's a very nice, well-defined uh, lesion. Is it a non intermediate cellular mass? No, it is in the pituitary gland. Is it a paracellular mass? No, it is in the pituitary gland. The stalk is nice and thin. There is no dual tail sign. So we are dealing with a common garden 90% pituitary incidentaloma, adenomatous incidentaloma. So this is all this that I have described is finished in one minute actually. When you put the MRI up on the string and you cut, you know, this is an adenoma, chalo aage. Aage, what do we do? Is the adenoma hormonally active? Is the adenoma causing mass effect? So you need to ask for history. Hypophysitis, they can cause diabetes insipidus and ask for mass effect, which is visual symptoms. So you look for any stigmata, pushing syndrome, acromegaly, is there galactoria? Any features of hyperpetitism, pale skin and, and, and loss of hair, and assess the visual field by confrontation method. If you find something, then of course you go for a proper visual field assessment. So, proper history for this lady would now be seen in neurologically for non specific giddiness, no issues of hormone excess or deficiency, menstrual history normal, no issues of DI, no issues of visual symptoms, no postural drop in BP. This is hinting towards uh, adrenal insufficiency. No features to suggest hypopetitism, pushing to rectomegaly on examination. Again, no galactoria. Visual field is normal. So this would be a proper detailed history and examination of somebody who comes with an incidentally detected pituitary lesion, which have excluded and confirmed it's a pituitary adenoma. So now when you've done that, you have to exclude is the adenoma hormonally active. So Dr. Mukherjee asked all the questions. It's not pushing, there's not rectomegaly, there's no uh, suggestion of prolactic normal, why do you want to do hormonally active? Because there are what you call uh, uh, subclinical presentations. Sometimes prolactic can be two, three times elevated. There will be no amenorrhea, no galactoria. Uh, galactoria is not present in everybody with hyperprolactinemia. So it, it could still be a prolactinoma incidentally detected. So there's no real consensus about the optimal workup strategy. Uh, my last slide will give you the, the reference. There is the Endocrine Society guidelines way back in 2011 that will uh, guide you a little bit. I'll share what I do. Now, serum prolactin should be measured in all patients. Silent somatoform of adenomas, uh, yes, possible. You could do an IGF-1. Silent corticotrop of adenoma, best test is, uh, is unclear. You could think of with an overnight dex suppression test, and if it does not suppress, you can do a low dose dexamethasone suppression test. Is it causing a mass effect? You have to look for features of hypopetitism. You have to look for do all the hormonal evaluations, visual field defects, and cranial nerve deficits. So coming to our patient, if you see, it's not go from below up. It's not a vascular lesion. It's not a metastasis. It's not pituitary abscess sarcoid. It is not craniorapis cordoma polyxis, it's not meningioma, it's not germinoma teratoma, it's not pituitary hypoplasia, so it's a pituitary adenoma. Is it causing mass effect? Before that, look at the hormones, prolactin is normal, thyroid is normal, cortisol was a little bit low rather than high, so she had a short synactin test, synactin is not available now, we have Cytopac, uh, and, uh, and she clearly passes, so there is no hypoadrenalism. IGF-1 is normal, visual fields are normal, it's expected as a microadenoma and it is not causing any, uh, hot, it's not hormonally active. So how will you manage this patient? Non-functioning, incidentally detected pituitary microadenoma measuring 8 millimeters. Refer for surgery, unfortunately, many patients get referred for surgery. Please, 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 refer to an endocrinologist. Give cabagoline, wait and watch, refer for radiotherapy, refer for gamma knife RT. What should you do? Evaluation of pituitary function in a microadenoma. First of all, whether it's hyperfunctioning, prolactinoma, never sent for surgery, dopaminagonist, others, you need surgery. Then, in our lady, it's a microadenoma. So, if it's a clinically 
non-functioning microadenoma, don't do anything, just follow up, repeat MRI one to five years, no change, probably let it go. If there is tumor growth, then you have to think of surgery. So answer is wait and watch. Take this young lady, 20 year old, headache off and on. There's, it looks like a cystic lesion, but then properly when you do a coronal scan, it's not a cystic lesion. It's almost <coughs> 10 millimeter in size. It's a macroadenoma. Hormonal workup is again negative. So it's a non functioning, incidentally detected macroadenoma because it's 10 centimeters, one centimeter. What would you do? Again, if it is hormonally inactive, macroadenomas, no mass effect, not abetting optic chiasm, again, don't send to the university for surgery. Please follow these patients up. And the frequency of MRI depends on you. Different guidelines would say different. I follow this six months, yearly for five years. And after that, I, uh, you decide how frequently you want to monitor. If the mass was abutting or compressing optic chiasm, you need to send for surgery. So this la lady also, we chose to wait and watch and again we have an opportunity to follow up over three years if you see quite a biggish lesion biggish lesion biggish lesion and then what happens over three years time the lesion shrinks it would have been really unfortunate if she had been sent for surgery and she would have ended up with some kind of hormonal deficit <laughs> look at this interesting lady long time ago but uh, I, I put this up because a 49 year old lady she came for annual checkup, non-specific giddiness. MRI was done and this lesion was detected. Large macroadenoma, you can see, still away from the optic chiasm. And if you see her serum prolactin, the unit is different, but it's almost 12 times elevated. And she had galactodia on stimulation for past four years, uh, sorry, eight years, from the age of 41. She thought it was normal. I'm getting menopausal so I can have some, some milk discharge for my breast. So what would you do? You would give cabagolin to her. And if you see over time, this large macroadenoma very nicely shrinks. There's a little bit of uh, the fluid accumulation in, in, in the lesion, not the uh, cystic. Sometimes it happens when you treat a prolactinoma. So serum prolactin, lesson number uh, two, three, four, whatever you want to say. Serum prolactin should be measured in all patients with pituitary incidentaloma before contemplating any surgical intervention. So I think I've got just another three minutes left. So I will give you my summary. 10% of the adult population may harbor a pituitary incident loma, provided you go looking for a for, for into the pituitary. Many a times when an MRI brain is done, uh, 10 millimeter cuts, three, four, eight millimeter cuts are taken, and pituitary incident lomas are not seen. But if you focus, you may find in one in ten people. Microadenomas far, far, far outnumber macroadenomas. It's essential to decide whether it's an adenometacellar mass or a non-adenometacellar mass, paracellar mass. Because non-adenometous cellar or, or paracellar masses definitely need involved treatment. There could be so many things and a, a proper workup is required. If it's an adenometacellar mass, then two questions must be answered, whether it's hormonally active or whether it's causing uh, what you call uh, compressive symptoms. If hormonally inactive, if it's hormonally active, then of course you need to do surgery. Except for a prolactinoma. This is take home point two. Prolactinoma never sent to a surgeon unless and until indicated. Indicators are very few. And not causing any mass effect that generally can be managed by watchful waiting. I gave you the frequency of, of a follow up MRI. And as I said, prolactin secreting tumor should be treated with dopamine agonist therapy. So, this is those of you who are waiting with bated breath, when to send them for a surgery. This is from this guideline. You can take a picture. This is probably the only uh, proper endocrine society guideline. There's another uh, uh, article in 2016 in Europe in General of Endocrinology. You can just Google, you will get it. It's a free download. These two are the very nice resources for, for particular incidentaloma. So if there's a visual deficit, other visual abnormalities, optic nerve or chiasm compression, apoplexy with visual disturbance or hypersecreting tumors, other than prolactinomas, that is when you would think of surgery. So in summary, in the last 20 minutes, I've taken you through incidentally detected pituitary lesions. First of all, decide whether it's hypertrophy, whether it's paracellar mass. I think, yeah, whether it's a meningioma, whether it is, uh, where do we have it? Uh, whether it's a craniopharyngioma, first decide that. Majority of the times, more 90% of the times, there will be an adenoma. When you find, like, like this one, like our patient, if it's an adenoma, then you decide whether it's functioning, functioning surgery. Majority of them are non functioning. Non functioning, look for compressive symptoms. If they are none, then you follow them up. I hope uh, you've learned something. With that, uh, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you.